Thank you. Some of the things I'm going to share with you today are quite disturbing, but I want to assure you that they are all backed up by evidence. A lot of this evidence can be found in the materials at our booth, at the Family Watch International booth. It's not on the main floor, it's on the next floor up, or on our website at familywatchinternational.org. I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach to this topic because Family Watch International is a non-religious organization and we take all of our positions based on social science data and the outcome on well-being for men, women, and children. Yet, we have a great focus on promoting religious liberty and respect for religious and cultural values because all of the social science data that you can find shows that when men, women, and children practice the religion, and it doesn't matter what the denomination is, that benefits and positive outcomes come to them and to society. Many of our organization are deeply religious in their personal lives. We have members from faiths from all around the world in 170 different countries, but because our organization is not a religious organization, I'm going to approach this issue from the clash and describe the clash between sexual rights and religious liberty. In order to do that, we need to have a working definition of what are sexual rights. These are some of the claimed sexual rights. This is not an exhaustive list. They range from laws or policies relating to contraception, abortion, sexual expression, gender identity, even sex change operations, adoption, marriage. Many of you are engaged in battles regarding these issues in your countries. But what is the real battle that we're engaged in to protect the family? I'd like to propose that a great deal of this battle is a war over the context in which sexual relations occur, or where they should occur. And there are two main sides to this battle. First, there's religious or the pro-family side. And this side holds that sexual relations should only occur in marriage, and that any sexual relations outside of the marital bond of a married mother-father family, and it doesn't matter whether those relations are homosexual, heterosexual, extramarital, or premarital, any sexual relations outside of marriage will bring negative outcomes for men, women, children, and society, and all the social science data will back this up. This side also holds that gender is a biological reality that you are born with, it is fixed, and it is not changeable. You are either male or female. Now the other side, I will call them the sexual rights activist views, and in our work at the United Nations, we come head to head with these groups, countries, and NGOs pushing this view. They believe that children, humans, are sexual from birth, that obtaining sexual pleasure is one of the highest goals in this life, and that the pursuit of sexual pleasure from the youngest ages is a fundamental international human right. Can sexual rights and religious liberty coexist? No, absolutely not. They are not compatible. Hillary Clinton at the United Nations, the US Secretary of State, on International Human Rights Day stated gay rights are human rights and human rights are gay rights. Later in her address she stated, perhaps the most challenging issue arises when people cite religious or cultural values as a reason to violate or not to protect the rights of LGBT people. LGBT stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transsexual. The people who hold to this philosophy believe that the biggest obstacle to sexual rights and their agenda is religious liberty because all the religions in the world, pretty much, across the board, promote marriage, between a man and a woman and sexual relations within the context of that relations and they teach parents to teach their children to confine their sexual relations within the marital bond. 
the main strategies that we come across, and I'm sure many of you come across, but at the United Nations is they seek to take UN treaties that have already been signed many times, many years ago by countries and to misinterpret them. And the way they do this is they get their um, friends in high places and UN agencies and they issue documents and definitions that redefine words and all sorts of things. And they also um, get the UN rapporteurs to give reports, the UN committees to reinterpret and tell nations they're out of compliance when they tell them that they have to adhere to things that were never in those treaties. The High Commissioner of Human Rights is at the forefront of this and even the UN Secretary General. The second goal that they have, and we saw this last month at the Commission on Population and Development, a huge push to establish comprehensive sexuality education as an international human right, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. And exploiting the HIV AIDS pandemic. They seek to get their agenda attached to somehow showing it will prevent AIDS so that they can get their AIDS money, and instead of using that money to discourage the behaviors that cause AIDS, they actually encourage the behaviors that cause or would lead someone to uh, acquire an HIV infection. We have a documentary that is going to be shown um, either after this session or right before the, ex the next session. There's a five-minute trailer of one we just produced called Cultural Imperialism, the Sexual Rights Agenda, and it will be documenting a lot of the things that I'm talking to you about. One of the key documents of the sexual rights movement, I don't know if you've heard of this, but this is the Joke Jakarta Principles. This was created by so-called experts in international law. Nine UN rapporteurs were involved in drafting this document. It has a lot of things that are con counter to um, many religious and cultural values, but Principle 21 is the one I'm highlighting here because of our topic. Um, Basically, it's interpreted to say that sexual rights trump religious liberty. Uh, it says that governments are to ensure that the expression, practice, and promotion of different opinions, okay, we're going to mandate what kind of opinions you can have, what kind of convictions or beliefs you can have with regard to sexual orientation and gender identity, cannot be undertaken in a manner that will violate human rights. And then they redefine all the international human rights instruments to even go so far as to say that a human right is governments need to provide sex reassignment of surgery or help and support for those seeking to change their gender. This is a cartoon that was handed out at the United Nations and presented there to teach youth about their rights under the Joke Jakarta principles. This is a girl and she has a tear in her eye. She is in love with her female teacher, and she just found out that her teacher is moving, and she's very sad and goes into a deep depression. Because of this depression, she finds a lesbian girl in her school who she ends to bond with and starts a relationship with. And of course, her father is very angry, and of course, he's portrayed as someone very evil and violent, and he slaps her, and then it, it pans, I, I don't have time to show you this whole thing, but it pans to all these pages that show how like the father is violating the child's international human rights by denying her the right of association and, and all sorts of things. And of course, the story ends happily ever after because she's realizing her internationally recognized human rights by having this relationship despite the wish of her parents. I'll move on now to comprehensive sexuality education. This kind of education is designed to raise up the next generation to promote sexual rights and to try to realize their sexual rights and to demand them from government, from abortion through same-sex marriage and all those other um, um, claimed rights that I showed you. And one of the biggest organizations pushing this the most um, um, aggressive at the United Nations, manipulating the whole UN system, the UN agencies, they're in their lights giving all the presentations, they get their employees on government delegations representing countries and pushing for these sexual rights. Their philosophy is sexuality is about a lot more than having sex. It's about the social rules, economic structures, political battles, and religious ideologies surrounding physical expressions of intimacy. This is what they're training children in. Um, this is, oh, I missed a couple of slides. 
There was the quote that I just read. Here is a, a, a publication of comprehensive sexuality education promoted at the UN and distributed at the UN by International, um, by International Planned Parenthood. It's called Healthy, Happy, and Hot. I picked it up at one of the Girl Scout meetings at the United Nations. But it teaches, this is meant for children infected with HIV, and it tells them they have sexual rights relating to sexual orientation and gender identity. They have a right to sexual pleasure, and that sexual and reproductive rights are recognized around the world as human rights that they can claim. Here's um, some excerpts from that. Teaches children to be sexually promiscuous, to explore the other person's body with their mouth and hands, fantasies, all sorts of things that I don't even want to repeat here that they're promoting through this manual handed out at the UN. This is another curriculum that International Planned Parenthood along with the Population Council and UNFPA of the United Nations is recommending it. It's called It's All One. They handed it out at a, they launched it at an invitation only breakfast in the UN cafeteria. And here's some excerpts from It's All One and what they're saying is the right, an international right for children to be learning and they're trying to get this into all the different curriculums. And the scary thing is that they say that this curriculum responds to international policy mandates in different UN treaties and called for by different UN agencies and even is called for by the Millennium Development Goals. These are the UN agencies that are involved in promoting this. Um, Plan, International Planned Parenthood receives money, $3.5 million in 2010, from these UN agencies, and then they promote this agenda uh, together with them. This is UNESCO's International Guidelines on Sexuality Education. It was meant to go to all the ministries of education in the world. It also purports this, purports this world view of sexual rights to children. Here's some of the ex excerpts. It, it promotes respect for diverse gender identities and sexual orientations and so forth. It's more of the same of what we've already seen. It's on one of the UN websites still right now, even though they said they revised it and toned it down after there was a lot of complaints. So we live in a world turned upside down. In today's world of political correctness and tolerance, we've gotten to a point where to sin is not a sin, but to call a sin a sin is a sin. I'll say that one more time. To sin is not, a, not to sin, but to call a sin a sin is a sin. And you know what? We need more of us to be standing up and speaking out against these things. I would like to invite all of you to join us in doing exactly that. We need your help at the United Nations. We need people, good people from every country coming, monitoring what their government's doing, reporting back to their people, and getting people upset if they're taking the wrong positions. We've had very good success in changing UN instructions and what they were doing by making people in their capital aware. We invite you to join with us and be one of the volunteers on our teams. We invite you to join with us in signing our petition to stand for the family. We have it here um, at our booth, up just up the next level. We have it in English and yellow, and we have it in blue and Spanish, and our volunteers might even have it available here in the room. If you sign this petition that says you support efforts to protect the family by protecting marriage, family, life, parental rights, and religious freedom, then as we go to the UN, we can say we represent X amount of people in X amount of countries, and we have a bigger voice. But the most important thing is you'll receive our notices about what's happening there, and you'll, be, you'll receive our invitations to come help us with this battle. If you cannot come to the UN, because it's a far trip and this is not viable for everybody, we need help in capitals. We need people we can call and email and tell what's going on and tell them what their government is doing, and we need you to help get that, the word out into your newspapers, into your governments, so that we can stop this awful onslaught on the innocence and the health 
of our children that violates the religious and cultural values which are actually upheld in international standards that should be protected. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that the family is a fundamental natural group unit of society and is entitled to protection of society and state. All of these sexual rights that are being pushed on children throughout the world through the United Nations system violate the rights of children and the right for them to grow up in a healthy manner. I thank you for this opportunity and look forward to hopefully speaking to some of you. We could also use help getting our new documentary out to raise awareness of these issues that hopefully you'll see the clip later. You can come talk to me about that if you want to help it be shown in your country. Thank you. Recently, there was an announcement, um, both by, the, by David Cameron and uh, by President Obama, that, you know, they, they are willing to cut off aid to countries who do not recognize LGBT rights. No, we want to object to that as just being manipulation. President Obama issued a directive to all U.S. government agencies that engage in international activities to make advancing LGBT rights a top priority. We have done more in the two and a half years that I've been in here than the previous 43 presidents to uphold that principle. The Obama administration defends the human rights of LGBT people as part of our comprehensive human rights policy and as a priority of our foreign policy. For us, family stands at the heart of everything we do. We live for the family. Gay rights are human rights, and human rights are gay rights. We do not want any discrimination against anybody under any condition, whether sexual or otherwise. But we have to state clearly and forcefully that this concept stands against everything we stand for in Africa. They actually said that for us to combat HIV and AIDS, we needed to legalize prostitution, legalize homosexuality. Infection rates are going up in the US. Huh? They're going down in Kenya. They seem to be going down in Ethiopia now. They went down in a major way in Uganda. And yet we're going to these countries and telling them how to prevent AIDS. Our approach is gradual. Abstinence, be faithful to each other, but if you can't, use the condom. What is amazing is that these countries that are har harassing us, smaller countries, in these countries, the rate of HIV AIDS, it is said to be out of control. What arrogance to, for us to tell them how to do something that they're doing better than we are. And that's, that should be obvious to the casual observer. UNAIDS published and circulated an email which was false and malicious ab about me because they felt that they needed to have in the document language relating to men who have sex with men and sex workers. As a result of the pressure that UNAIDS put to bear in this email, CARICOM's negotiating position was changed and I was advised that my contract would not be renewed. My brother Luigi and I had an opportunity to go to the United Nations where we saw developing countries trying to force the African countries to accept comprehensive sexuality education. It's about starting when we're with children about the expectation of, of, of roles and we need to start there. This kind of education tells youth they can have fun and have sex and just use condom. This kind of message was a death sentence to not only both of my parents but also my brother Rogerio. And this is because it lets um, our population believe they can let their guard down and they can actually behave in risky behavior because of the uh, belief that these condoms can actually prevent AIDS 100% and that is not true. In Dr. Green's book, Broken Promises, how the AIDS establishment has betrayed the developing world, he says the research shows that the sexual rights approach to AIDS prevention 
championed by the UN and Western donor countries may actually be increasing the rate of infections, not bringing them down. And if he is right, millions have died unnecessarily. Well, the end result will be the construction of what we of the family system and the family structure in Jamaica. It is an affront to the principles of the UN Charter. A UN agency should not be allowed to overstep its, overstep its bounds in such a manner so as to influence the outcome of negotiations. What we see is the LGBT agenda being pushed uh, in, 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 you know, like a carrot stick for aid money. You want aid money, then you must uh, change your laws. These issues of uh, lays, gays and uh, transvites, transsexuals. This is a new form of imperialism, I must say. History will look back on this period and say one of the great abuses of the latter part of the 20th century is a failure to do AIDS prevention in ways we know are effective. It's deception.